our two speakers for today. So here we have David Cohen, the manager of the Sea Urchin Hatchery, who is employed through PCSU and DAR. And he's located at the Anui Nui Fisheries Research Center on Sand Island with Wesley Dukes, a contractor through the Hawaii Coral Reef Initiative with DAR's Aquatic Invasive Species Team. And um, we are accepting during this presentation questions in the Q&A box and chat. Um, and we'll read them at the end and go through them if you guys have any questions. So um, feel free to type them in as they're presenting. But without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dean uh, Cohen. Wes and I will be speaking to you today about the state's efforts, um, our efforts to combat invasive species on Oahu, invasive seaweeds that is. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who we are and why we do what we do. Um, then I'll tell you about the introduction of a non-native seaweed in Kaneohe Bay. Lastly, I'll give you a brief synopsis of how we grow urchins in the hatchery. Then I'll pass the, the whole thing over to Wes and he'll tell you about planting urchins, how he monitors them and our metrics for success. So we work for the state of Hawaii's Division of Aquatic Resources. Um, the mission statement for DAR is to manage, conserve, and restore the state's unique aquatic resources and ecosystems for future and present generations. And if you read a little further, it says specifically that our job is to fight invasive species and to reduce the, their harmful impacts on native ecosystems. So a couple of these invasive species are the Kapophycus and Ukema, uh, seaweeds that were brought into Hawaii um, to see if we could establish a seaweed carrageenan industry. The original introduction is very, very well documented. Uh, Dr. Max Doty started working with the seaweed in 1974. A few years later, Dennis Russell reported that the seaweed would not grow well in Kaneohe Bay. In fact, he said it lacked the ability to disperse over shallow depressions, both in the reef and in deep water and it did not colonize neighboring reefs without the help of man. Uh, that wasn't exactly correct. We sort of found um, a little later, uh, doctors Kule Rogers and Fanny Cox from the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology found that the seaweed had indeed spread. And a few years later, Eric Conklin and Jen Smith confirmed that the seaweed had spread throughout the bay. Uh, so around that time, some very clever people from the University of Hawaii, the Nature Conservancy and the Division of Aquatic Resources came together and developed the idea for a two-tiered approach to combat this invasive seaweed. Um, first, we remove the seaweed where necessary and then we add sea urchins to keep the algae down and to control it out on the reefs. Uh, we grow the sea urchins at the hatchery for this purpose and for this project and, and it works. So. So at this point, I'll give you a quick recap of the, the 20 year history of, of this, this project. Um, Dr. John Stimson was really the first one to suggest using the urchins to control the seaweed. And he, along with some folks at UH DAR and the Nature Conservancy developed the idea in the early 2000s. The hatchery was finally built in 2010 and we had our first successful larval run that same year. Our first outplanting was just over, ten, just over 10 years ago in January of 2011. By the end of 2017, our initial invasive seaweed removal goals had been met, but we continue to spot treat with urchins uh, where it's necessary. And as of last Thursday, 600,000th urchin was released from the hatchery and um, we do name every single urchin that leaves the hatchery. And in this case, Jen Devine, our host, had the honor of naming that urchin and she named him Hank. So uh, Jen told me that Hank was going to start a blog called Dispatches from Reef 14 by Hank Gratilla. So stay tuned for future updates from Hank and from Jen. It takes about five to six months to grow an urchin uh, to the proper size for outplanting. We release them um, when they're about five to six months of age and at about 15 millimeters. Um, that's about the size of a dime. So what does it take to, to get a sea urchin from egg to outplanting? 
Uh, first, we need clean filtered seawater and a climate controlled lab. Uh, we culture phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are single cell plant microalgae that live in the water column. Um, we also grow benthic diatoms, which are single celled marine plants that live on the bottom or on surfaces. We also need to grow macroalgae to feed the urchins once they're big enough to eat it. But the most important thing that we need, of course, are baby sea urchins. And now we get to answer that awkward question, uh, where do baby sea urchins come from? And of course, we know they come from adult urchins. About once every six weeks or so, we spawn urchin, urchins. Uh, Wes and his team will go out to the wild and collect adult urchins and bring them in. Once they spawn, we mix gametes. And about 24 hours later, we have free swimming larvae. The urchins are stocked into larval rearing tanks and fed with phytoplankton every day. We check feeding rates and do a larval health assessment and population assessment every morning, and then we perform water exchanges or tank changes every day. Animals are fed after the water exchange. A few hours later, we check the feeding rate again, feed them where necessary, tuck them in for the night, come in the next day and do it all over again. That goes on for about 25 days. As the larvae mature and they develop, we start to notice signs that they're ready to settle down and become sea urchins. They begin to develop adult structures like tube feet and pedicellaria. And that's when we know that it's time to move them into settlement tanks. So prior to moving the urchins into settlement tanks, we grow biofilm um, of benthic diatoms on these wavy plates that are in the upper left-hand corner of your screen there. The benthic diatoms serve as food for newly settled urchins. We'll then take the prepared plates with biofilms and move them into the settlement tanks that are in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, then we'll add urchin larvae to the tank. And if all goes well within a few days, larvae go from free swimming little larvae to bottom dwelling sea urchins. Most of them settle on these diatom coated plates. And then a few weeks later, it's time to count them. So in order to count all of these teeny urchins, we call on our friends and colleagues for help. We'll stand around the outside of the tank and count these seven week, year old, seven week old urchins. Um, many of them are less than a millimeter in size and we count each and every one. The plates with the baby urchins on them are then carried uh, to the other end of our greenhouse and placed in the grow out tanks. Of course, this is a pre-COVID SPAC count. Th this, the, the photographs here are from a little over a year ago. As a matter of fact, uh, the person you see in the bottom right corner of the screen carrying the urchins on the plates is Natalie Dunn, and she'll be speaking to you this afternoon um, at about two o'clock about ballast water and biofouling. So stay tuned for her talk. So after a few weeks, the urchins are moved into the grow out tanks. Um, and after a couple of weeks, in the, a few weeks in the grow out tanks, they're, they're large enough to start eating seaweed. But once they start eating seaweed, they grow very rapidly. So they come into the grow out tanks when they're seven weeks of age. They start eating limu when they're about three months of age. And once they're 15 millimeters, anytime from four to six months of age, they're ready to start being harvested in stage for outplanting. That's when Wes and the AIS team take the urchins out to Kaneohe Bay and to Waikiki to eat the invasive seaweed. And at this point, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Wes, and he can tell you about what we do uh, with the urchins once they go out in the field. Thanks, Dave. Uh, let me just pull my portion up. Does that look, look good to everybody? <clears throat> All right, I'll take your silence as yes. Looks, looks good to me. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Dave. As, as uh, he mentioned, this brings us to the uh, field portion of our show. Um, so the hatchery staff spends hours harvesting the urchins from grow out tanks uh, when they're about 15 millimeters um, for us to take out and 
out plan on the reefs. Uh, at at 15 milliliters, they are small enough to uh, get down into the pukas in the reef and graze on the little bits of algae that, um, if we were manually removing, would require us to get in there with uh, tweezers and dental picks. Um, but at that size, they're also large enough where we can place them where they need to be and they won't just get uh, completely blown away and lost off the reef forever by by any um, currents or swell or um, anything that could affect these little guys from um, being where they need to be. Uh, <clears throat> I believe uh, pictured in the bottom right, uh, those are some urchins that went out uh, last year. I, I believe it's Walter and Stella, um, but Jen can verify that in the chat. So <clears throat> as uh, mentioned earlier, uh, when the algae is really thick, the urchins need a little help from us. Uh, up until 2015, uh, our team was operating the super sucker pretty much daily to keep algae levels low enough uh, for the urchins to do an effective job. Um, the, as as uh, a lot of you know from past presentations, the super sucker is a big underwater vacuum. Um, it's a trash pump mounted on the barge pictured above. And the business end is handled by a diver in the water, methodically sucking algae from the reef uh, the super sucker can, can clear uh, about a 10 meter by 10 meter patch of reef in uh, 45 minutes, give or take, depending on uh, algae coverage, um, density, thickness of the mat. Um, so in uh, 2015, uh, we experienced a statewide algae die off. And since then, we've been able to keep the super sucker uh, tied up and on standby. Uh, and have been able to control the algae in Kaneohe Bay solely with urchins. Uh, and by control, uh, our, our target uh, algae coverage is uh, each reef we like to keep below 5% um, algae coverage. Um, <clears throat> it We have started to see it come back on reefs that uh, we've outplanted in the past and then taken out of rotation. Um, but the, uh, the urchin production by the hatchery crew uh, has been ramped up and we've been able to keep pace with uh, any algae that is trying to come back. And uh, so far we've been able to maintain uh, all the, all the reefs that we work with um, below the 5% coverage. So how, how effective are the urchins? Uh, well, there was a pilot study in 2008 and um, half the reef was cleared uh, manually. And within uh, six months, the, uh, al all, all of the invasive algae grew back on the cleared reef. Uh, <clears throat> In 2009, half the reef was cleared again manually with the super sucker, uh, but this time urchins were added to to uh, maintain the cleared area. Um, the urchins were herded on a monthly basis to keep them in the study area, uh, and uh, a year later, the the area that was cleared and stocked with urchins was still relatively clear of uh, the seaweed. Uh, so then the urchins were removed altogether and the algae started growing back. Um, so this shows, this shows that even though the urchins aren't effective on clearing the really thick mats of algae, uh, the dense mats, on their own, um, we can't keep the, clear, the reefs clear without them with the super sucker alone. Uh, so it's, it's this bond between um, our team and the urchins, and, which is why we allow Jen to name each and every urchin that we put on the reefs.
So thank you, Jen. Uh, so the, the uh, reefs picture in yellow, uh, this is Kaneohe Bay. Um, these are all the reefs that we're currently monitoring and stocking. Um, since the hatchery began producing urchin in 2011, um, we've placed urchin, uh, urchins on 25 reefs throughout the bay and have treated approximately 254 acres of patch reef and fringing reef habitat. Uh, <clears throat> Urchins are also used in various other projects. And as, as Dave mentioned, uh, we recently hit the uh, big 600,000 urchin milestone. So um, big shout out to the hatchery staff on that. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, these maps are uh, generated from our annual monitoring. Uh, so in order to track the algae and forecast urchin outplantings, we conduct um, what are called snap surveys uh, to monitor and map uh, the subset of reefs that we're working on in the bay. Uh, the snap surveys are uh, essentially our whole AIS team, along with uh, any help we can get from um, the hatchery staff that wants to get out in the field, um, interns that we have, random people off the street. We just take them out, throw them, give them a stick. And uh, we, each, we each throw, we call it a snap stick and it's uh, marked out and where it lands, we take a GPS point and um, note uh, any, any of the uh, benthic habitat that it's on. So uh, we note coral, rubble, pavement, um, various algae. Um, so these, these two maps, uh, this is of uh, Marker 12, which is up in the North Bay. That was um, one of the first reefs that we started working on. Um, you can see the Capophycus and Euchema cover is uh, really spread out and uh, not, not very dense. The reef on the right, that was, uh, it's Reef 23, that was a control reef up until uh, last year, we began outplanting. Um, once we had shown the project to be effective, we decided uh, we're better off clearing all the reefs rather than leaving the controls to to seed um, other areas throughout the bay. Uh, so these maps, we we use them to forecast how many urchins to put on the reef and uh, also where on the reef, do we outplant the urchins? So um, we know looking at this map of reef 23, we would um, focus our efforts on the left side. <clears throat> so this, uh, this is from the same survey. This is um, a layer of the coral coverage on the same reefs. Um, so as you can see, two different habitats. Um, Reef 23 is a lot denser coral around. Um, Marker 12 reef is spread out with uh, big area, bare areas throughout, uh, but there's still the, the dense, dense coral around the edges. Um, so these coral maps we use uh, more in the event that the algae comes back so much that we essentially need to uh, do reef triage. Uh, and then we look at the reefs with the highest co-occurrence of uh, coral and algae and treat those first to um, try and save the, the corals from being smothered by the algae. So uh, again, another product of the SNAP surveys. Uh, this is uh, a comparison of the uh, coral to algae cover. Um, so this is essentially what we would use for uh, what I was calling the triage on the last slide. Um, the reefs with the higher coral cover, which is the um, blue bar, um, and the higher algae cover, which is the green dot, we would, we would focus our efforts on those first. And as you can see, Reef 23, which I showed in the previous two maps, um, was our control reef. 
this survey was conducted around the same time we began out planting on that reef. So any of the, the urchin um, grazing clearing of the reef would not have been illustrated in that survey. Uh, we've got our annual survey scheduled for um, next month. Uh, we normally we normally survey every March. Last year we were due to COVID. We had to delay until June. Uh, but after the surveys next month, I expect to see uh, that that green dot um, much much lower on Reef 23. Um, and as you can see, all the other reefs they are um, pretty much all below two percent algae coverage, and our our threshold for success is uh, five percent. So. <clears throat> So along with our full snap surveys, we also just do a, a presence absence of algae on um, the reefs that haven't shown a lot of algae in past surveys. Um, so we can figure out the presence absence by swimming over and uh, taking GPS points um, methodically where we see algae and then mapping that. Um, if we do notice that a particular reef start showing higher algae coverage, we can elevate that to a full snap survey uh, and uh, put it back in the uh, priority list of, of urchin outplanting. Um, so as, as you can see, um, this, this map, it, it shows where algae is present, but not necessarily um, how much? So it's it's much faster than our snap surveys, but it uh, you you do lose precision. Um, so there's there's a trade off. Um, <clears throat> so moving out of the bay and all, also in the bay, um, Caphophycus and Euchema are not the only invasive algae to smother our reefs. Um, these are pictures of uh, Gracilaria salicornia. Uh, also known as gorilla ogo, over overgrowing live corals, um, and uh, sites like this can can be seen at spots um, all around the islands. So um, after we we uh, demonstrated success um, clearing algae in Kanioe Bay, uh, we have expanded our project to a portion of the uh, Waikiki MLCD and FMA. Um, this site was um, slated for 104,000 urchins uh, to treat 4.3 acres of algae uh, within this uh, general area, which is uh, approximately 18 acres. Uh, the area has high grassland area coverage and uh, parts of it look very similar to the pictures in the last slide. Um, we started out planting in the MLCD last November and as of yesterday have out planted uh, 55,450 urchins of, of our 104,000 urchin goal. Um, we'll, we're monitoring the algae twice a year in the MLCD um, and uh, we use these maps to, to kind of pinpoint where we want to outplant. Um, so yeah, it's uh, exciting news to be able to branch out of the bay and um, the hatchery is producing enough for multiple projects. So let's uh, knock wood, fingers crossed, all that good stuff uh, that we keep it up and can expand further. So that's it for my part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wes and Dave for that um, really insightful presentation. Um, I did see a few people, other people trickle in while you guys were presenting. So um, if it's okay with everyone, I'm just gonna relaunch the poll while we wait for some questions to trickle in. Voted and I see there's a couple people that had some questions in the chat. 
So the first is, are the urchins sensitive to temperature changes or increases in nutrient loads due to heavy rain or runoff events? And the answer is yes. Um, the temperature ranges for the urchins, they can handle up to about um, 30 degrees Celsius. And um, then they start to really bum out. Um, they, 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 they become unhealthy at about that temperature. I'm not sure about the nutrient loads. I'm sure that they're very sensitive to that, um, but they are sensitive to, to big fluctuations in salinity. So when you get a heavy rain event, um, when the salinity drops to 25 or below, uh, you can see, I, I think in the lab, when we expose the urchins to lower salinities, we start seeing some mortality and some morbidity. Okay, and another question from the chat as well. Do you ever receive any pushback from people by using the term biocontrol? Not yet. Not, not yet on, on our end either. <laughs> We actually did get another question. Are you planning on expanding the project further? As, as opportunities present themselves, yes, we will expand the project further. But at this point, we have no, we have no sites uh, lined up to expand the project. Thank you guys for your presentation. Um, and again, if anyone wants to learn more about the urchin hatchery or the invasive algae project, I have linked our DAR website in the chat. So feel free to visit there if you guys want any more information about uh, anything that was talked about today. So hey, Jen. You. Oh, it's Chelsea. Sorry. I can't type fast enough and I have the opportunity to use audio. Um, I just had one more question. Um, it, it, so would you need another facility on the outer islands to be able to kind of expand to other islands or could you trans like do everything you need in the Oahu facility? That's a really good question. Uh, we have not tried shipping urchins to neighbor islands yet, um, but I suspect that if we, I suspect that if we had a, a large invasive seaweed problem, on a neighbor island, it would probably be good to have a hatchery closer to the outplanting site. But again, we haven't tried it yet. Um, it would be an interesting experiment. Uh, I'll add that um, on, on our end on outplant days, uh, we work as fast as we can along with the hatchery staff to uh, get the urchins loaded into trays, uh, into the tote, on the boat, and out in the water as uh, quickly as possible. We haven't done um, any, any mortality studies on how long we can take, if we can stop for coffee, uh, but we haven't tried. So um, yeah, just, just um, on our end, I know, I know uh, speed is of utmost importance and um, they do seem uh, a little less active as you get uh, more to the bottom of the tote on larger outplants. So it just, just seems that um, hours are fairly precious, but uh, I, I will mention that I, I have zero experience shipping live animals, so. <laughs> yeah, thank you, David and Wes. That was a great presentation and such a great project to learn about. And when COVID <laughs> moves on, um, I think HISC staff would love to come out and do some out planning. Excellent. Elizabeth in the chat, second year uh, sentiment, <laughs> Chelsea. <laughs> Everybody wants some field time right now. <laughs> <laughs> Even our field team wants field time right now. <laughs> We're getting cooped up in the house right now. But all right, well, thank you, Wes and Dave.